to uh, some information that will give our audience uh, about you, your background, your education, and some of the things that are important in your life. And then we'll have an opportunity during this first segment to deal with that. And then we'll have our break and we'll come back and deal with Afri African Americans and the institutional church. Let's do it from that uh, perspective. All right. Well, I was born here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, my father was here serving as the chaplain at the prison prior to the prison that preceded Riverbend. Mm -hmm. And my mother came to join him and left a career in social work and teaching to join mm -hmm. him. And we lived here for about a year and a half. Um, moved to Atlanta uh, soon after that. And I grew up in Atlanta as a son of the church. Mm -hmm. um, third generation United Methodist minister on my father's side and fifth generation mm -hmm. uh, United Methodist minister on my mother's side. Mm -hmm. and. I grew up in those kinds of churches where each and every day God was made relevant to the issues that we faced, uh, the challenges that people faced, particularly uh, black churches and those black congregations that cared about the world that we had to deal with. And so you didn't have to wonder whether God was real and you didn't have to wonder whether the love of God was real. You felt it inside those caring communities. And so those are the kind of churches that shaped me. And, and in that regard, I became a son of the church, a deep love for the church, particularly the black church. Um, I grew up in Atlanta, uh, went on to go to Emory University where I studied English literature and African-American studies, double major. Uh, went on to study at Gammon Theological Seminary at ITC and uh, studied biblical studies and theology. And finally uh, completed my education here in, again in Nashville where I took a PhD in religion uh, at Vanderbilt. Uh, along the way, I met some, and I was shaped by some significant faculty members, uh, professors like Dr. Charles Colfer, who is considered the father of African-American biblical studies, and Randall Bailey, uh, who taught me, was my first Old Testament teacher at, uh, at ITC. And here, my advisor was Dr. Renita Weems, mm -hmm. who directed my dissertation. Uh, Dr. Colfer taught me the importance of cultural context in the Bible, looking at, look particularly at African context and finding not only myself, but my community in the text. And Randall Bailey taught us how to think critically about the problems we faced and how those problems were made relevant in our own interpretations. And finally, Dr. Uh, Dr. Anita Weems uh, really took me and honed me and made me, made me a scholar. Um, any faults I have are my own, but uh, what, what, uh, what I find that's good in my work has to do with the caliber of instruction I got from, from great professors. And so I, I'm grateful for, for my journey. Along the journey, um, what I found to be uh, most important, not just the education that I got, but the experience I got along the way. Um, I served as pastor of Old National United Methodist Church for several years in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, it was one of those congregations that accepted a young student pastor and taught me that while it was extraordinarily important that I studied hard, but it was also important that I took what I knew mm -hmm. and I knew not only did I know the books, mm -hmm. but I had to know the lives of the people. Mm -hmm. I had to understand where religion, if you will, where, where religion hit the ground. In other words, where the rubber met the road mm -hmm. and the kinds of difficulties that real people faced as they, as they attempted to live faithful lives. Mm -hmm. And so I was blessed to be, be the pastor of that church for several years where I really learned um, not only, how to, not only how, to, how, to, how to care for and lead a community, but I also learned why biblical interpretation is so important for our churches. Um, I left there and served as, as, a, as the university chaplain at Clark Atlanta University for several years. And um, there I met some of the most, some, some of the brightest and most inquisitive students who really mm -hmm. pushed me uh, to think not only outside of my education, but also to think outside of the confines of, mm -hmm. of regular churches. Very good. And, and of course, what we're going <coughs> to, excuse me, doctor, what we're going to do is to take our first commercial break right. and then we'll come back and uh, complete uh, some of the information that you're giving us now. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break.
At, uh, was she at Vanderbilt University? Yes, she was my advisor at Vanderbilt, name? yes. Uh, that's, when, when was that, uh, when she advised you at Vanderbilt University? That would have been uh, 97, 98. Yeah, I think I met, I uh, think I met her about that yeah, time. Yeah, I was yeah. Uh, till about 2002. I graduated 2002, yeah. 2003, yeah. Yeah, uh-huh, very yeah. good. Yeah, I know uh, Professor Weems. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, and uh, so what, we're, this is the second segment, right. and this is when we'll start talking about the institutional. I'll introduce the, the uh, show itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you and welcome to back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Dr. Herbert Marbury from Vanderbilt University and he's given us some information in reference to the institutional church. And he's also given us some excellent information concerning his background and some of the experiences that uh, led him to us this morning. And so Dr. Marbury, let's see if we might be able to pick up where we left off and to have you to start talking about uh, African-Americans and the institutional church from your perspective. Well, I think what's foundational for the, for the institutional church for African Americans, and perhaps foundational for most churches, but particularly for black churches, is the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, you find it uh, in the pulpits. Uh, we preach from it. We, it. It is our authority for, for our moral life. And it is for most Christian communities, the Word of God. And I tell my students, uh, every time they step into a pulpit in the midst of a community of believers mm -hmm. and they speak from the Bible, they are speaking for that community. Good. What is the word of God? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that that um, captured my attention when I was a student at ITC and then later at at at, uh, at Vanderbilt mm -hmm. uh, had good professors like Professor Victor Anderson mm -hmm. and Professor Lewis Baldwin, mm -hmm. uh, who interest me not only in ethics, that is, that is how black communities think about what's right and wrong, mm -hmm. but also interested me in the history of the black church. Mm -hmm. um, and from that standpoint, I wanted to, st I wanted to know, mm -hmm. well, why, why do black churches, why do churches in general mm -hmm. think of the Bible and use the Bible so differently? Mm -hmm. For example, you, you look in Nashville and you've got churches from one end of the city to mm -hmm. the other. And on fundamental issues, we disagree, and yet the same book is being preached from our pulpits. And I began to, I began to wonder, well, what's going on? It's not the book, the book is the same. Mm -hmm. What's going on the way that we interpret these it's texts? It's the interpretation of Absolutely. the book. Absolutely. Exactly. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to study how African Americans historically mm -hmm. have interpreted the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the reason I. Put the, I, I wrote Pillars of Cloud and Fire. Mm -hmm. um, it begins to look at, begins to look at African American biblical interpretation mm -hmm. from the antebellum period, Good. starting with starting with slavery. Mm -hmm. And I look mm -hmm. at, I look at various examples, an example, a radical example, and a conservative example mm -hmm. in in the antebellum period, beginning with um, Absalom Jones mm -hmm. and David Walker. Mm -hmm. I move on to look at Reconstruction with. Um, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper and John Jasper, mm -hmm. the Harlem Renaissance where, with um, Zora Neale Hurston, mm -hmm. then the era of civil rights with um, Adam Clayton Powell and Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. And finally, I look at the era of black power with Albert Clay. Mm -hmm. each, each one takes up the book of Exodus, mm -hmm. but takes it up in a very different way. And they take it up based on what I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. That is, what are the relevant challenges mm -hmm that my community faces. How can I continue to make the Word of God, the Bible, relevant 
And so during, during the uh, antebellum period, Absalom Jones and David Walker both take up the story of Exodus almost literally, mm -hmm. that if God delivered the children of Israel Good. from Egypt, across then, the Red Sea into the promised land. Then God. And then God will do the same. <laughs> and the promised land was freedom from slavery. Mm -hmm. Well, freedom from slavery came mm -hmm. and we weren't free. Mm -hmm. uh, we faced Jim Crow and segregation. Mm -hmm. And so if you go to, to the era of reconstruction, uh, the pr and you look at sermons, the promised land doesn't, doesn't look like freedom from slavery. Emancipation is no longer, mm -hmm. is no, is no longer identified with the promised land. Mm -hmm uplift is. Well, how do, we, how do we educate now? How do we move from just emancipation to education and the kind of cultural attainment that will lift black communities? Mm -hmm. And after, after Reconstruction, that changes again in the Harlem Re Renaissance. This mm -hmm. idea that we need to throw off the manacles of slavery, the old, the old Southern sort of African-American rebirth and a and rebirth. That's, that's right. right. The Renaissance mm -hmm. man, mm -hmm. uh, Renaissance man, Renaissance woman. But for the Harlem Renaissance writers, for the most part, mm -hmm. except for Zora Neale Hurston, mm -hmm. they were really thinking rather in, in sexist terms. So mm -hmm. They were thinking the new Negro was mm -hmm. a new Negro man. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Uh, but but Zorno Hurston, I thought, was one of the most interesting figures during that time. Her Moses, Man of the Mountain, um, re helped African Americans rethink the Exodus story in a way that took the focus off a singular figure, like a Moses figure, and put it on the community and asked us to imagine together what it would, what it would mean if we all together walked into the promised land and we weren't waiting for mm -hmm. or dependent upon one singular figure or God to send one person mm -hmm. to deliver a whole group of people. Mm -hmm. um, and then I go on to look at the era of civil rights with Adam Clayton Powell and Martin Luther King Jr. who understood the Exodus story in the promised land as being, mm -hmm. as being included as full citizens. Mm -hmm that we would certainly enjoy, as Dr. Martin Luther King would say, the blessings of liberty. And, and if you look at his speeches, he takes the rhetoric from the Constitution and the Declaration mm -hmm. of Independence, the kind of rhetoric that, that founded our nation, mm -hmm. and he connects it to the Exodus story. And freedom means becoming a full citizen. Mm -hmm. um, well, after, at, at a certain point, after, after the, by the end of the Civil Rights mm -hmm. Movement, we find that Adam that um, Albert Clegg mm -hmm. wants to do something very different with that. Mm -hmm. That there's the frustration uh, that has risen because African Americans still aren't enjoying the blessings of liberty. Mm -hmm. There is a move to take that story and to claim it for ourselves mm -hmm. and to claim the power to change mm -hmm. our lives. Uh, not that power, uh, but, but not placing it in the founding documents, but placing it in black communities mm -hmm. themselves. And so we get the black power movement. So I wanted to look at the various ways that we have interpreted one singular book, the mm -hmm. book of Exodus, mm -hmm. over the course of a long period of time. But my, my, my concern was to show that each interpreter started first with the concerns of their community mm -hmm. at that time. And I, and I wanted to encourage uh, my students who were, who were going to serve churches and serve in religious communities to do the same. You know, <clears throat> during this, uh second segment, I mean, the final segment, mm -hmm. what I would like for you to do is to, uh, and I think you've mentioned uh, Adam Clayton Powell mm -hmm. and Dr. Martin Luther King. I, yeah. I think that these are two giants, yeah. but I think that people know more about uh, Dr. King mm -hmm. than they do about Adam Clayton Powell. Mm -hmm. And so during this second, uh, this final segment, when we come back, we've got about uh, 45 or 50 uh, seconds here. But when we come back during this uh, final segment, what I'd like for you to do, and I say this now because I don't want 